The following four stories are true. A middle-aged woman enters an upscale jewelry store while waiting for a friend. After trying on several pieces, she notices the time, says goodbye to the clerk, and walks out. In Las Vegas, Nevada, a group of college students looking to let off a little steam decide to take a weekend trip to Vegas. They gamble, enjoy a steak dinner, and 48 hours later, they are back in class. On the SS Vancouver, an Italian immigrant looking for the American dream arrives in the US and finds it. And on St. Patrick's Day in Boston, two police officers responding to a disturbance call arrive at a local art museum to investigate. These seemingly ordinary, everyday events are not what they appear to be. The woman walked out of the store wearing a stolen $30,000 diamond ring. The students were professional card counters who took the casinos for millions. The immigrant used an elaborate scheme to trick people out of their money. And the two police officers were actually art thieves who pulled off the largest art heist in American history. The woman, the students, the immigrant, and the police officers are what we call masters of the heist. Confidence men, grifters, charlatans, and cheats. There are many names, but these characters have been pulling one scam or another for as long as one can remember. The scores are big, the heists are clever, and the hustlers are larger than life. Well, you know, a confidence man, uh, the reason they're called con men, short for confidence, is that they inspire confidence in others. And uh, they do have that, uh, that feeling of, um, of giving something to you. There's always that trust that you feel they've trusted you first. Uh, uh, that's where it comes from. And your people who are, uh, are confidence guys really do have that skill of talking and engaging people. Every guy that goes to work every day and gets a paycheck at the end of the week wants to hit it big and not do that. And this is the, this is the dream. People want to get a little bit more than what everybody else is getting. They think, I finally found the opportunity. I have the opportunity no one else has, and I'm going to make money off of it, and I'm going to be OK. Charles Ponzi came to this country in search of the American dream. Within months of starting his business, he was the toast of the town, taking in over $10 million. How did Ponzi do it? Well, here's how. This is Charles Ponzi. He had a great idea. I've got a great idea. And he tells everyone he knows about it. Step right up. If you give me money in 45 days, I give you 50% more. I guarantee it. And the money starts rolling in. But soon, the investors come knocking at his door. Hey, Ponzi, where's our money? But does he have their money? Sure, I got your money. Sure he does. <laughs> and word travels fast. Yeah. Unbelievable! It works! <laughs> One person tells his friends, who tell their friends, Hello? and soon people Whoa. young and old, rich and poor, flock to Ponzi. Even the original investors put their money back in. Now, Ponzi is on top of the world. Mr. Ponzi, what is your secret? Here's what I do. I buy you foreign stamps and uh, convert them into American dollars tisk, and I... Tisk, uh... Ponzi. Isn't it true there is no real investment? Aren't you just using money from your new investors to pay your old investors? You are correct. It's true. Silly Ponzi. Hey, what you it. don't realize is that your pyramid is growing too big. Soon, you won't be able to bring in enough new investors to pay your old ones. And the weight of the pyramid will be too much for them to bear. And like all Ponzi schemes, it will collapse. 
Arrivederci! And that is the birth of the Ponzi scheme. Seven months in 1920, almost $10 million was invested by 30,000 investors. And many of them were Italian immigrants, just like Ponzi himself. They trusted him. They said, he's got to be telling the truth. The money's being paid out. But a local newspaper exposed it, and the scheme was about to collapse. And it's hard to believe this, but investors still believed. They wouldn't give up. They said, this is, this is, this is our savior. He's made us money. He's making us money. This is a good thing. Meanwhile, the scheme was unraveling, and seven months after a scheme began, Carlo Ponzi was arrested, he was convicted, he went to jail, he was deported to Italy, and he died with $50 to his name. You cannot believe how much people want to believe that these Ponzi schemes are real. I don't think you can blame the people in a Ponzi scheme for wanting to, uh, to better themselves. I, th I think it's the, it's the criminals that do that. Ponzi schemes are more prevalent today than they've ever been in history because of the internet, just thousands of them. The internet makes it easier for everyone. It makes it easier, it makes it faster, it makes it cheaper for anyone to perpetrate a Ponzi scheme from their basement. But it's also easier for us to track. And I would rather live in a world where computers were wide open and everybody left their doors unlocked. That's the world I want to live in. And if I want to live in that world, one of the things I have to do is not celebrate people who violate society's trust. People make a living cheating at gaming. That's what they do for a living. And they've been, we have people who've been on our files for over 20 years. Blackjack is the last casino game that can be beaten legally. Card cunning is actually a science, a skill, and an art. With enough time and effort, anyone can do it as long as they practice and train. Uh, the toughest thing with counting cards, though, is putting your money on the line. From 1994 to 2000, one group of students has been winning millions counting cards in Las Vegas. They are known simply as the MIT Blackjack Team. Card counting has been around for a while, since uh, 1962. That's when Ed Thorpe wrote Beat the Dealer. And at the time, he was a professor at MIT. What Ed Thorpe did by writing the book is he informed people that if they're smart enough, they study enough, uh, they can beat the game of 21. Nobody can beat casino games. Well, here's a game that can be beaten. So there wasn't any new knowledge, um, but what we were really good at was executing it and applying it. Welcome to the basics of card counting. In a casino, Blackjack is different from all other games because as the cards are dealt, the odds are constantly changing. Now there are two important things you need to know about Blackjack. Low cards are bad and high cards are good. With more high cards, a player is more likely to get Blackjack, while the dealer is more likely to bust. The way you keep track of the difference is by using what we call the point count system. No matter how many decks, there's always an equal number of high and low cards. So low cards are each worth plus one while well, the high cards are worth minus one. The more high cards that come out, the lower the count, and it's time to leave the table. The more low cards that are dealt, the higher the count is, and it's time to bet big. Now that seems like simple mathematics, but how fast can you count? And the count is? Zero. Zero, that's right. The way our team operated in the casinos is that we would have a big player, you know, such as myself, and then I would play with uh, spotters. Now, the rule of the spotters, they were supposed to just keep track of the net difference of high cards and low cards. And they would either just watch the tables or they would sit down at the table and, and bet, you know, table minimum. And the spotter's goal, if the table wasn't hot, they would get up and go to the next table. Their goal is to find, you know, keep dipping their toe in and find the hot table. 
and when a table would get hot, they'd signal in a nonverbal signal. The spotter would signal the count to the big player. The big player would come in, you know, swoop in and start dropping the big bets. When you practice in a controlled environment, you kind of uh, get in a comfort zone where when you then go to a casino, if you're not trained with all the outside things going on, you know, casino hosts coming up to you, other players talking to you, cocktail waitresses asking you your drink order. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a new ball game for you, so. Once the big player was called into a hot shoot, a spotter at that point would then pass off the count using a code word. Like for example, eight was skate. You know, I gotta skate out of here. Well guys, I think I'm gonna skate. So then at that point, the big player would know that the count was uh, plus eight. Using the big player spotter approach, it had several advantages. One is just the efficiency. Because if you're playing by yourself, you can only sample like four or five shoes, maybe an hour. Whereas if a big player goes in with four spotters, now you can count down up to 20 tables an hour. Because the spotters aren't tied down to any table, they can you know, float about. Uh, another big advantage of the strategy we used is it provided a natural camouflage. Because if you know, I got called into a table and started betting big, the casinos would think, well, there's no way he's counting cards because he just walked up to the table. When I first started playing as a big player and was winning, um, the casinos didn't seem to mind too much because they know, you know that even the average gambler is gonna win sometimes. But it was the consistency of the winning. So it was after, you know, 10 trips, you know, they might look at a, you know, my record and say, hey, he should have lost 100,000 and he's won 200,000. You know, this doesn't add up. So, you know, that's one of the challenges for a professional card counter, because if you're really good at what you do, you're gonna win, and ultimately, no matter how well you fool the casino, that win is what's gonna <laughs> get the casino, you know, on your set. I really don't think that most people are that much aware how many cameras there are and that all the things that are being watched. And certainly if you're not doing anything wrong, it's of no importance to you. Um, nobody's gonna save a picture of your Aunt Maud in her plaid shorts, because if she's walking through the lobby, nobody cares. But if she lands on a table and she starts fooling around with the cards, then somebody's gonna have a picture of Aunt Maud and they're gonna wanna know what's she up to. Uh, what we do is very different from people who actually cheat and actually um, uh, you know, use outside information or tools or markers or whatever it is. What we do is completely legal. We're using information that is available to everybody at the table and we're not altering the game in any way. A lot of people hold the cheater and the card counter on the same level. I don't look at card counting as cheating. Gaming many years ago made the decision that if you're using your brain to count cards that it's not illegal. However, since that time, card counting has taken on a whole new face and they have teams and groups of card counters whereas one person counts the cards and the other person then comes and they bet large amounts of money. Now these people that are signaled into the game have not counted cards and they have information that's not available to the other people on the table. If it wasn't for card counting, I doubt blackjack would be as big as it is today. There's a book that keeps undesirable people that the casinos don't want in. And they always put us on the top row of each page of the book. We we're kind of the poster child of, uh, of the uh, casino undesirables. We would pass out pictures of this is who was out and this is who was about. And, and sure enough, you'd take them and show up to the people in the pit and they'd go, that's, yes. When we finally saw some of these flyers, these investigative flyers on some of the people, it was actually uh, one of Mike was uh, it was a great picture, and we uh, kind of were joking. Did you did you pose for this picture? And he looked at it and he said, "Oh, that's my yearbook photo." The yearbooks out of MIT were a great deal helpful. Had some marvelous pictures of these people looking all bright and shiny and studious. In reaction to when the casino started catching on, we kind of modified our strategy. We actually went to what we call the signaling gorilla big player strategy. Now with that strategy, we actually would have two players uh, sitting at the table at the same time. We'd have the signaler who'd, who'd still be betting table minimum, and through different signals that we had, 
they would be controlling the gorilla big player and telling him how much to bet and how to play his hand. And so a gorilla big player was someone who actually didn't keep, keep track of the count at all. You know, they were just simply taking signals. And it worked well because since he wasn't actually keeping track of the count, he could really concentrate on his act and, you know, really make it apparent that he wasn't keeping track of the count. So in terms of the amount of money we could win on a weekend, it could range from 10 to 20,000 to, you know, our best weekend ever was we won half a million dollars. You know, it's not a guarantee you're gonna win on any one short trip, but you know, over the long run, we knew that we were gonna come out way ahead. You know, professional blackjack's a cash business, so we're always carrying around large amounts. You do get used to strapping a couple hundred thousand dollars onto your, in your body and walking through security, but at the same time, when you win a half a million and you brought a half a million out there to play with it originally, and you're trying to haul back a million dollars in cash, that's a little cumbersome. We get asked a lot, how much money did we win over the years? You know, the number is, is somewhere up in the range of about $10 million. I think for most of us, just having the opportunity to go on these great trips, uh, live the life you know, of a high roller and bet big money, I mean, that, that was a pretty easy sell for a college kid. To be college kids doing our thing and be able to put together a scheme, the teams, and all the preparation that we put into it, uh, it was, it was kind of it's kind of nice. It's kind of impressive looking back at it. The team play is happening now. It's never stopped. At all times, there's there's something going on. There's wherever there's money, there's usually people trying to get their fingers on it. She said, I have a million dollar story to tell you. Let's write a book together. Doris Payne is a 75 year old black woman who has spent the last 50 years walking into jewelry stores, charming the clerk into bringing out several pieces. And she will just walk out with a diamond ring right on her hand, right under the clerk's nose. She's a coal miner's daughter from West Virginia who grew up youngest of six kids. And her first incident was when she was 13 years old and her mother had sent her down to the general store to pay down their account. So she went in and was telling Mr. Benjamin, oh, if I get good grades this semester, my mom's gonna buy me a watch. And so he brought out the watch case and started letting her try them on treated her like a little lady. She was having a great time. And then another man walked into the store and Mr. Benjamin hastily put away the watches, kind of pushed her to the front of the store and she realized she still had a watch on that he had forgotten. And so she very deliberately turned around and said, oh, Mr. Benjamin, you forgot this watch. And that was it. She figured out that she could, she could do this. Doris Payne has 22 aliases, including Louise Davis, Thelma Louise Creighton, many others that she used all throughout Europe. She would go to Cartier in Paris, Bulgari in Rome, her Royal Majesty's jeweler in London, and take whatever she wanted. She said she would subscribe to Town & Country magazine, pick out a piece of jewelry that she saw in an ad, and she would fly to that store to look at that particular piece of jewelry and walk out with it. As a black woman, her race was not an issue. In fact, it was an asset over in Europe, so she found it much easier to move around among the high society. She called it dressing up. And sometimes it would take her weeks or even a month to get ready to do something, and she'd kind of immerse herself in this society in preparation for stealing a jewel.
Her shoes and her handbags were the most important piece of what she was wearing. And I, I don't know if you'd even say she would charm the clerks. I think she learned to just play off of them. And the less she would tell them, the better. The more she would let them assume who she was and the type of money she had, the better it was. She had a personality that would ultimately get people to let their guard down by her conversation, changing the subject away from the things that she was contemplating buying uh, to maybe talking about baseball or any number of things that she'd want to discuss, just taking people off guard. She called it organized confusion that she could create, where she would mimic what the clerk was doing. If the clerk was moving rings from one finger to another, Doris would do the same. She could move things with her hands uh, so that it was hardly noticeable. In most cases, not noticeable at all, obviously. So she was very talented uh, most of the time. She could distract people in such a way that they had no clue of what was going on. But she never concealed the rings or the bracelet or whatever piece of jewelry it was. And usually it was a ring because she would just put it right on her finger and walk out the door and disappear. Sometimes head straight to the airport and leave the state or the country. The FBI has estimated probably 400 jewel thefts over a 50-year career. The biggest ring she ever took was the one in Monte Carlo. She walked into the Cartier store in Monte Carlo and asked the clerk to bring out several different rings for her to look at. And she says, well, you know, I ended up walking out of the store with a 10.5 carat diamond ring, which is huge. A 10, 10 carat diamond ring would go from knuckle to knuckle. I mean, most eyes in the facility you would think would be glued on anything uh, that valuable, but obviously they let their guard down and away she went. And she hopped into a cab, went straight to the airport in Nice, and was arrested there. And that's where the game began of concealing this ring from the authorities who were investigating her. Eventually, they ended up moving her to what she describes as like a fifth-rate motel in Monte Carlo because they didn't really have a jail to put her in. And they kept her there, and they searched her room at all hours of the day and night trying to find this ring. And she had asked one of the clerks of the hotel for a needle and thread. She said she'd torn the hem of her dress. So she took the stone out of its setting and sewed the diamond into her girdle. But then she took Kleenex and whip-stitched buttons so that they all looked and felt the same. So that if someone ran their hands over the girdle, you wouldn't be able to tell that she'd sewn the diamond in there. And for nine months, they kept her under arrest doing this investigation. But she did say to me that, strangely, it was some of the most enjoyable months of her life. She was in a room with a balcony overlooking the Mediterranean. She could hear the nightlife of Monte Carlo. She was able to order from the restaurant downstairs, so she would eat fabulous meals every night. She said, uh, the French can season a chicken like no one else. After nine months, they never found the ring. So the investigation was over. They put her on a plane back to New York, and she kissed the ground when she got there and headed straight to the uh, Diamond District in New York City and got rid of the diamond, so she says.
I'd been in and out of the museum many times. And uh, many times I sat outside the museum at night to essentially get an idea of what they had for security. And uh, they didn't have a whole lot. Oh, he's a criminal. <laughs> Make no mistake, Miles will tell you he's a, he's a criminal. He's an outlaw. Really, you know, up until the 90s, I mean, he was still the guy, you first guy you thought of when, when, when an art theft happened. It was decided the best way to go in there and take it down was essentially to go in there masquerading as two police officers. The gardener basically had given over nighttime security to a couple of college kids who were interested in art. Uh, it was, as they would say in the underworld, an easy score, a piece of cake. Relax, gentlemen. This is a robbery. The cardinal rule is never to let anybody into the uh, museum, but I guess uh, they didn't realize uh, that this could be uh, a robbery. Boom, once you're in, it's all over. The first thing they do is disable the security stuff. Uh, you know, you pull some plugs out. They grabbed one of the cassettes that would have shown what they look like. And then they basically had the run of the place for, it would have been till dawn, presumably. There were five pictures taken. There was Rembrandt's only seascape, The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, an extraordinary Vermeer called The Concert, and a portrait of a couple uh, by Rembrandt, and then a flink landscape. Also a Manet called Chez Tortoni. There were five Degas works on paper, a sketch of Rembrandt's, a self-portrait, and then, of course, this Chinese coup and a finial from a Napoleonic flag. The theft to me and, and to the community and actually to the world at large is a crime against civilization. It's removing extraordinary works of culture from our, our history, from our capacity to experience them. If you were to never be able to see Shakespeare's Hamlet again, or if you were never able to hear Beethoven's Ninth Symphony because it was sucked out of our heritage, what would that do to civilization? Well, it's the same with removing Rembrandt's only religious seascape, The Storm on the Sea of Galilee, one of Vermeer's few remaining pictures. These are treasures that belong as part of civilization, and to remove them is to remove a piece of our humanity. And I think if the people that did this understood that, they might be interested in seeing these returned. I don't think they understood what they were doing. I really don't. Uh, the items that I had planned on taking were not all the items that they took, but were certainly some of the items that they took. Miles was in jail in Chicago at the time of the robbery at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. They woke Miles up in a cell. They verified his identification card and his fingerprints to make sure that Miles Connor was locked up and had not perpetrated that robbery because he was then the number one suspect and remained as the number one suspect for a long period of time, even though he had been incarcerated. We have the largest art theft in the history of the United States, and we have no suspects in jail. We've had a lot of uh, leads that have been uh, faithfully uh, followed out by the FBI. And not one thing has been recovered, not one. The Gardner crime always intrigued me because, you know, it sort of came and went from the headlines pretty quickly. I mean, there were, I had looked at our old clips on it, and it was like major heist hits museum. And then, you know, these kind of the years rolled by, and there was like no leads and, and nothing really interesting. And I just started digging into it myself. I mean, could this guy be connected with this guy? You know, where was this guy at the time? You start just kind of piecing together in your mind, you know, who might the likely suspects be? And I thought, well, I got to at least pursue this Miles Connor angle. So I went up to see him, and that's where I got the first tale, uh, where he really laid out the story of what he thought had happened. The people who did the crime were my friends, and I had planned the crime with them. 
And of course, the people that I planned the crime with were Bobby Donati and David Holden. So, yes, the museum theft was done on my idea. I had planned it with them. Then I ended up getting locked up and sent away, and they came out to, to Lompoc. At least uh, David did and told me he had done it. The stuff that was taken was basically stashed very carefully among Miles' belongings so that he could be in control of the stuff, even from prison or once he got out. And they were going to use one of the major pieces to get me out, uh, wait a little while, and then essentially say, OK, we want Miles released for this. And then when he went back, he had a heart attack and died. The other guy who was involved, he was killed, murdered. Between the time of the heist, when they were alive, and the seven years later, when I first got on this, they had managed to die. Houghton had a massive heart attack and keeled over, and Donati ended up, you know, in a trunk. Uh, so, so that was unfortunate. And so now, no one really knows where the paintings are. The museum is a composition, a work of art, so of course to remove pieces from this composition makes us lose an arm. We're incomplete because they're gone. So these are just priceless, they're not replaceable, and they remain lost to the museum. A lot of people have said it was like the blue collar type of mentality, that they were given a list of what they should get. They did it in a very crude and Neanderthal type of way. They just cut them out. They just basically cut them out, leaving, you know, about this much canvas all around the perimeter and rolled them up and, and took them that way. Why they did that, uh, I do not know. It, it, it's something that I would have never done. Over the last 20 years, the price of art has skyrocketed. There's so few Vermeers left in the world. A Vermeer alone had to be worth, I would say back then, probably $30 million. Today, we'd probably be up in the $500 million. The museum has had a reward since early in this loss, and it now is a $5 million reward that the museum offers to a person or people who can bring the work back to us. You know, really, the case was kind of moribund when, when I kind of stumbled across it. And uh, lo and behold, this guy Youngworth popped up in the newspapers as a guy whose place was raided, and they had found this item among his possessions that Miles Connor was known to have stolen a good 15 years earlier. He had done a few things for me in the past so that I trusted the man. So I essentially gave him carte blanche to everything that I owned. Obviously, the suspicion grew, well, you know, the stuff could easily be among Miles' belongings, hidden away in some secret compartment, maybe rolled up in a tube and stuffed in among of other tubes, looking all innocent like it was just some old poster when, in fact, it was a Rembrandt. Bill Youngworth traveled to meet with Mr. Miles to try to explain away what happened to Miles' goods and that um, he found something in those goods that may lead to something else. With Miles's permission, Youngworth started saying, I have access to the art and I can arrange its return in exchange for A, B, and C. He, he had some demands. And then he came to see me and I said, I'll negotiate in your behalf and Miles' behalf. I don't want to see the property, but if you're telling me you have it at some point, you must produce something and it must be more than a photograph. And that's when I embarked on this late night ride where I was taken to a warehouse to see, to view, what appeared to be one of the stolen paintings. And, and that's obviously was a fairly exciting moment for me and also an interesting moment in the investigation of the crime.
So it's a little bit eerie. You know, you are kind of in the middle of nowhere, you know, and it's in this kind of dark and isolated district. There's not anybody else around. And it seemed like the kind of place you might keep stolen paintings, because, you know, who the, would ever think it was there? The person I was with had keys and access to the warehouse. We went in and up a few flights of stairs into one of these warehouse uh, storage rooms where you have private access. And there was a bin that you store things in. And inside the bin, these sort of big, kind of hard cardboard tubes with little lids at both ends. And the top was taken off and out came this painting. And uh, the person who had it sort of held it up like this and had a flashlight and was sort of used the flashlight to kind of show me the painting and then sort of shined it on the Rembrandt signature. Now, obviously, I'm no art expert, but it was certainly done well. And I felt afterward there was a good chance this was the real thing, because to put that much energy into a falsification, to fool me, when in the end of the day, if it's a phony, they're going to know the first second. They, I mean, the experts at the museum are going to know. It just didn't make sense to me. So that's why, at the time, I felt very confident that it was the real thing. It was exciting right afterward because obviously we got a very exciting front page headline out of it with the wonderful headline, we've seen it, and that generated a lot of attention. And things progressed and uh, we thought that there would be something turned over. But the feds basically said, well, you know, that's not, that's not evidence of anything. So the next step in the process was I said to Youngworth, well, how about some photographs? You know, maybe that would be more convincing. So we printed them out. We looked at them very carefully. We examined them. We showed them to art experts. But again, the reaction from law enforcement was, why should we believe these photographs are real? It's not credible. And then the third step in this little sequence was, to my mind, still the most interesting, which is when I received the the paint chips, which I uh, had independently tested. And they determined that there's no question that these were chips from the 1600s of the kind of paint used by the Dutch masters. And if that was a uh, legitimate lead, we're, I'm just wondering why um, all of a sudden everything shut down. They gave them every opportunity in the world to uh, produce the paintings and um, uh, there was no, uh, no results. Eventually, the US attorney said, nothing is being turned over, and that's when Young Worth backed off and I stopped negotiating. And literally, the thing just fell apart. Whatever he showed Mashburg, I don't know. But you could be sure of one thing, that if he still had it, it would be returned for the money. I mean, five million bucks is a tremendous incentive to uh, get anyone to uh, turn the thing in. You know, there have been thousands of leads, and I have been through so many that I don't even get involved in them anymore because you get so excited, and then there's nothing at the end of it. So we're left with this mystery, and we don't know whether this was really an authentic opportunity to get a hold of this art that just kind of went by the wayside because there were too many conflicting, confusing interests at work, and it just never came together. In the meantime, the Gardner case went on and on, and it became a curse. Miles Connor had a heart attack, lost some of his memory. The FBI agent in charge of the invest investigation was killed in a car accident. Another suspect, a person of interest, was shot and killed by his wife. So there's been a curse to this entire matter of the Isabella Stewart Gardner robbery, and not one thing has been recovered. After the frames were restored, I decided we should hang them as an homage, as a statement that we are in mourning of this loss, but we also hold them open for the return of the work. 
Well, I'm an optimist, and I believe that uh, we will eventually, um, you know, succeed in getting these paintings back and putting them back in the uh, Isabella Gardner Museum where they belong. I don't have any concrete, I can't lay my hands on the things. If I, I did, then needless to say, I'd be $5 million richer and probably a couple of my friends who are locked up would be free. And so, uh, but uh, I unfortunately currently have no idea where they are. And that's too bad because if I did, they'd have their paintings back. You know, over the years as I've thought about it and I've seen the delays and I've seen the, uh, you know, the sort of the lack of progress, I, I just have the sneaking feeling in it that the art is just kind of lost. That somehow, somewhere along the line, they ended up, you know, like in a trash heap or, you know, in some storage place where they were forgotten for a while and then disposed of, you know, that they've just kind of been lost to the sands of time. I mean, that's sort of my fear. If the Stone of Sea Galilee was rolled up and Young Worth had it, it's gone. If the Man and Woman in Black, Rembrandt, was rolled up and Young Worth's possession gone. If the self-portrait, which is rather small, and Young Worth said that he'll burn it and film it and send it to the newspapers, Nobody has seen that. We'll never know. Maybe. The con man, the swindler, the hustler, the thief. These masters of the heist are out there, lurking in the shadows, waiting to take advantage of their next unsuspecting victim. And if you think you can't be conned, think again. As a young man growing up, my father said, you have to remember that in the business that we're in, uh, people want what we have. So treat every single person that comes through the door as being guilty until they prove otherwise. Beware of opportunities that are today only. There's no opportunity that's a today only opportunity. Every opportunity that makes sense, every opportunity that's credible is one that can, you can sleep on. Sleep on it, think about it, talk to people, be careful. Uh, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. If you're thinking of going into cons, uh, I can just tell you, I think without fear of contradiction, it will ruin your life. Uh, you will get, all, you may make money but you will, you will buy that money with love and trust and a happy life. That's a pretty big price to pay.